from National Public Radio in Washington, a debate on detente before the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. Due to prior broadcast commitments, National Public Radio recorded this hearing at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, September 18th for broadcast at this time. The witness before the committee today is the Honorable Dean Rusk, former Secretary of State under Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. Secretary Rusk is the tenth witness in this series of hearings in which diplomats, scientists, and politicians have brought to this committee their views of our relations with communist countries. The hearing is chaired by Senator William Fulbright, chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. These hearings are designed to inform public opinion and assist our policymakers by bringing to bear a broad range of views and insights on such matters as arms control, trade, the tempering of ideological animosity, and the possibilities of broader human and cultural contacts as well as more cordial official dealings. I take this occasion, too, to announce the witnesses scheduled to testify over the next <clears throat> few weeks. Tomorrow, on September the 19th, we will hear Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. On September the 24th, testimony will be given by Abram Bergson, Professor of Economics at Harvard University, and Herbert Dinerstein, Professor of Soviet Studies, School of Advanced International Studies, Johns Hopkins University. On September the 25th, the committee will hear testimony by John S. Service, now of the Center for Chinese Studies at the University of California. Mr. Service is well known as an old China hand, having served in our diplomatic service in China during World War II. The witness on October the 1st will be George Meany, president of the AFL-CIO. And on October the 8th, we will hear a distinguished Soviet dissident and exile, Dr. Zoris A. Medvedev, now at the Medical Research Council of the National Institute for Medical Research in London. Our final witnesses as of now, appearing on October the 9th, will be Senator John C. Stennis, Chairman of the Armed Services <coughs> Committee, and Admiral Thomas H. Moore, former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Our witness today has appeared at this table many times on many topics. It may be recalled that on certain of these occasions, certain members of the committee did not share the witness's views, but members of this committee have always appreciated his strength of conviction, his intellectual honesty and integrity, and his unfailing graciousness in dealing with this committee. We welcome as our witness today a, a distinguished professor of international law from the University of Georgia, the former Secretary of State, Mr. Dean Rusk. Mr. Rusk, we're very pleased that you were able to come today, and we've Looking forward to hearing what you have to say about, I think, one of the most important questions facing us today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Senator Sparkman. Mr. Chairman, I very much appreciate your kind of personal remarks about me, and I'm very glad to be here. I was very pleased to learn that the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations <coughs> has undertaken to examine the ideas and issues which are associated with the word detente. And if I can be of any help, I'm very glad to do so. My opening remarks will be both brief and simple. Brief because of your time, simple because we probably need to clarify guidelines and compass bearings as we continue to deal with complex issues over a very considerable period of time. As far as I'm concerned, the word detente means an easing of tensions, particularly among those who might otherwise become adversaries. Detente is not a condition in which all problems are solved, but a process by which points in dispute are resolved and potential crises are anticipated and avoided. The desire of the United States to achieve normal and cooperative relations with the Soviet Union has manifested itself in a variety of ways since World War II. One of the first steps to be taken in that direction was the presentation of the Baruch Plan to the United Nations on the subject of nuclear weapons. It was obvious to our leaders in 1945 that nature would not yield up its secret on the basis of ideological favoritism and that the spread of nuclear weapons was to be expected. The Baruch proposals involved, essentially, the handing over of fissionable materials to the United Nations <coughs> to be used solely for peaceful purposes under a plan which would prohibit the possession of these weapons by any nation, including the United States. It was a tragic moment in the history of the human race when this plan 
with such changes as might have evolved from negotiation, failed to achieve its purpose. From that time forward, so long as the human race shall endure, its principal problem will be to keep the nuclear beast in its cage. If we regret the refusal of the Soviet Union to agree to the Baruch proposals, we should not indulge in sanctimony. We should at least acknowledge to ourselves that if the Soviet Union had been the first to develop nuclear weapons and had made this identical proposal to the United Nations before we ourselves had the capacity to make a nuclear weapon, we cannot say with certainty that the executive and legislative branches of our government would have accepted such proposals. But a crucial historical opportunity was tragically lost, and we're left with a major piece of unfinished business. One must also recall that Secretary of State George C. Marshall, with complete personal good faith, invited the Soviet Union to participate in the Marshall Plan. It was the Soviet Union which decided to reject that offer and insisted that two of its Eastern European neighbors do the same. Again, perhaps we can refrain from sanctimony, because I suspect that members of this committee would understand better than anyone else that there might have been serious difficulties in obtaining the necessary appropriations from the Congress at that time if the Soviet Union had become a principal participant in that great effort to rebuild war-torn Europe. There will be some who will not agree with the next point I would offer for your consideration. At the end of World War II, the United States demobilized its vast conventional military forces in a tumultuous fashion. In 1946, members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff told me that we did not have a single division in the Army nor a single group in the Air Force which could be rated ready for combat. Ships of our Navy were being mothballed almost as fast as we could find berths for them, and the ships which remained in service were being manned by skeleton crews. Our forces in the occupation of Germany and Japan were at only part strength and with a high proportion of new draftees. I seem to recall that our defense budget, along about 1948, had come down to $13 billion, and the impression was that it was on its way down to $10 billion. I think that one can make the case that through weakness, we in the West exposed Joseph Stalin to almost intolerable temptations. He tried to keep his forces in the northwest province of Iran, the first case before the United Nations Security Council. He demanded the two eastern provinces of Turkey and a share in the control of the straits leading into the Black Sea. He ignored agreements which provided for genuinely free elections in the countries of Eastern Europe. He gave both political and tangible support to the guerrillas attempting to take over Greece using bases and other help from Albania, Yugoslavia, and Bulgaria. A coup d'etat was arranged in Czechoslovakia under the shadow of the nearby Red Army. Berlin was blockaded and a green light was given to the North Koreans to go after South Korea. The revisionist historians may write all the books they wish, but in my judgment, these were the events which launched the so-called Cold War. Perhaps we ourselves bear some responsibility for the beginnings of the Cold War, but I would find that responsibility in our self-imposed weakness rather than in a policy of belligerency and hostility during that period of our national history. During the Eisenhower administration, thought continued to be given to the possibilities of resolving some of our problems with the Soviet Union. The Austrian State Treaty was concluded in 1955 after long and difficult negotiations. This was a major step which gave a neutral Austria its independence and resulted in a disengagement of Western and Soviet forces from a potential trouble spot. Also during the 1950s, it was possible to succeed in an important piece of preventive diplomacy, namely the Antarctic Treaty signed in 1959. This treaty deferred indefinitely, but without prejudice, competing national claims to that vast continent and removed it from military or other rivalries among the great powers. It is deeply satisfying to note that 15 years later, that treaty is operating smoothly and apparently to the satisfaction of all concerned. When President John F. Kennedy took office in January 1961, he and his senior colleagues soon found themselves in the presence of major crises. The pressures on Berlin were renewed at the Vienna summit between President Kennedy and Chairman Khrushchev in the harshest of terms. The Cuban Missile Crisis was as grave a crisis as most people think. Upon taking office, President Kennedy was faced with North Vietnamese incursions into Laos, supported by a Soviet airlift and growing pressures by Hanoi against South Vietnam. 
It is not my purpose in these opening remarks to go into the merits of these three critical situations, nor to elaborate such a tragic mistake on our side as the Bay of Pigs. <clears throat> the point I wish to make here is that President Kennedy and his senior colleagues quickly reached the conclusion that it was too late in history and too dangerous for great powers to pursue policies of hostility across the board in a nuclear world. We concluded that we should intensify efforts to find points of possible agreement with the Soviet Union, which would be in the interest of both sides, and which could serve to broaden the base of common interests and to reduce over time those points of possible friction which could lead to violence. There then followed, despite great differences on certain issues, such agreements as the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty of 1963, the Civil Air Agreement between the Soviet Union and the United States, providing reciprocal flights between New York and Moscow, the Consular Treaty between us and the Soviet Union, two important multilateral treaties aimed at removing outer space from great power rivalry, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and members of the committee will recall that President Johnson proposed East-West trade legislation to the Congress, which would have authorized the negotiation of bilateral trade agreements with the countries of Eastern Europe, and that this legislation did not reach the hearings stage in the other body of the Congress. <coughs> the next administration, I'm glad to say, continued the effort to broaden the range of agreement with the Soviet Union in such matters as the important four-power agreement on Berlin, the beginnings of agreements regarding nuclear missiles and an attempt to expand trade and economic relations. In addition, President Nixon made his dramatic visit to Peking, which I supported, and succeeded in establishing better channels of communication between our two capitals, even though the full normalization of relations with the People's Republic of China must await further development. These moves toward detente were not an American invention alone. Our allies in Western Europe preceded us in the expansion of trade relations and in the narrowing of the limitations on trade represented by such procedures as COCOM. During the 1960s, there were private discussions with our friends in the Federal Republic of Germany and in other capitals, which led to the development of Germany's Ostpolitik. Given the events of World War I and World War II, it is understandable that the reduction of the fear of and hatred for the Germans in Eastern Europe would be a major element in anything properly called detente. In a world in which thousands of megatons now rest in the hands of frail human beings, the pursuit of agreements which can reduce tensions is not merely good policy, but harsh necessity. I know that there have been some who looked upon me at times as a dinosaur of the Cold War. But I am, after all, one of those relatively few people who have shared highest responsibilities in a world of nuclear confrontation. It is a sobering experience. It is fair to say that the Cuban Missile Crisis left in its wake a deepened sense of prudence in world capitals. But it would not have been possible to say that had that crisis not been peacefully resolved. But the avoidance of such crises, which, comes, which come far too close to the edges of human survival, must be a major objective of policy. Detente does not mean that we should succumb to illusion or euphoria, or that we should fail to support the genuine interests of the United States and its people. We have not yet reached the point when we can expect the Soviet Union to trust us, or when we can trust them in the same way which marks our dealings with our neighbors in Canada and Mexico. For some time to come, I would expect that the most effective agreements with the Soviet Union would be those where performance on both sides can be readily ascertained and where the question of good faith does, does not even need to arise. For example, if the Soviet Union exploded a nuclear device in the atmosphere, underwater, or in outer space, we would know about it immediately and could tell our people about it. There is no opportunity, therefore, for demagogues on either side to build upon fear, suspicion, and hatred in the name of cheating on an agreement. Similarly, if the Civil Air Agreement does not work effectively for Pan American in Moscow, we can take that into account in the way of our handling of aeroflot in New York. If the Soviet Union should get out of the habit of paying its commercial bills in accordance with its agreements, its credit in Western markets would shrink or disappear. Without delaying the committee unduly, I should like to comment briefly on two important pieces of unfinished business between ourselves and the Soviet Union. The first has to do with further progress on the limitation of nuclear missiles 
both defensive and offensive. I am opposed to unilateral disarmament to the point where we might induce misjudgments and miscalculations in other capitals. I do believe that we should do what we can to reduce the burden of arms and to restrain the arms race, both through the elimination of the waste which is to be found in almost all large organizations, and more particularly by effective arms limitation agreements. I was glad to see that Washington and Moscow have agreed that ABMs would be limited to one site on each side. I would be glad to see agreement that deployed ABMs would be reduced to zero. On the matter of offensive nuclear weapons, we now face extremely complex problems. The nuclear forces on the two sides are not symmetrical and problems of verification can be formidable. Again, we might remind ourselves of a most unfortunate circumstance which makes our present task more difficult. On a certain Wednesday morning in August 1968, the leaders of the Soviet and American governments were prepared to issue a joint statement announcing that President Johnson would fly to the Soviet Union to initiate talks on the limitation of nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, Soviet forces moved into Czechoslovakia on the very night before, and that announcement had to be canceled. Had we been able to get at these discussions in a serious fashion in the fall of 1968, it might have been possible to deal effectively with the MERV situation. Now that matter is infinitely more complicated. I supported the SALT agreements which President Nixon brought to Capitol Hill, but we must recognize that these agreements are somewhat like building a dam one-eighth of the way across a river. Unless we can extend the effort, just as much water could flow in terms of the nuclear arms race as flowed before, if in somewhat different channels. Here is a matter on which we must keep trying. It will require persistence and patience, but also an infusion of the sense of urgency which the subject matter demands. Since my own student days, I've spent a good deal of time studying and thinking about past and current efforts to limit the arms race. I've just about reached the conclusion that if real progress is to be made, the approach must be wholesale rather than retail and must involve dramatic simplicity. Purely in terms of the limitation of arms, I recall with respect what Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes was able to accomplish in regard to naval disarmament in the early 1920s. The 332 formula worked out on that occasion, cut through Picayune debates about caliber and types of weapons and the comparability of various types of hulls and matters of that sort. Later political efforts de deprived that agreement of lasting historical importance. But the technique is one which needs present day attention. And I must say I had this in mind when I indicated my preference for zero ABMs. In this matter of the limitation of arms, it is worth a sentence or two to point out that arms races are not the monopoly of the two so-called superpowers. Over the years, I've tried to raise with other governments the possibilities of agreements which could limit some of the lesser arms races in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and as between India and Pakistan. I've been disappointed that more has not been achieved, but I suppose we will have to admit that lesser arms races also have their complications. Mr. Chairman, let me mention very briefly the second major topic which might be subsumed under the word detente, namely trade. I have long felt that we should expand our trading relations with the countries of Eastern Europe. There are tangible economic benefits to both sides in a genuinely two-way trade relationship and important political, intellectual, and cultural byproducts which could flow therefrom. I would approach this matter in the spirit of the old Yankee traders who would trade where there was an opportunity for both sides to obtain an advantage. However, there are two points in my mind which might appear to be qualifications on what I've just said. Given the urgent and pressing tasks which we face here in our own society, and the desperate situation of many of the developing countries with regard to external capital, I see no particular reason why we should subsidize the Soviet economy with long-range credits at concessional interest rates, which would not represent a flow of goods and services to us in exchange for what we send to them. Second, I doubt the wisdom of injecting into trade discussions other issues on which we hope to see movement on the part of the Soviet Union on the theory that we are granting a favor when we agree to trade and therefore are in a position to extract unrelated concessions in exchange for trade. 
I hesitate to go into this matter in detail here in a public session because I do not know the present state of discussion and negotiation on, for example, the immigration policies of the Soviet Union. I yield to no one in my concern for human rights, and I would be glad to see Soviet nationals of all faiths, atheists as well, enjoy the right of expatriation. But as I look back over the considerable number of agreements which have been worked out thus far, I doubt that we could have embarked upon the road of detente if we had qualified that effort by linking it with changes in the political, economic, and social structures of other nations. I believe that we should encourage trade and that we should work on Soviet immigration policies. It is the legislative linkage between the two which causes me some difficulty. Perhaps I might interject one other point here, not in my prepared statement, Mr. Chairman. Um, with, in, in, with respect to another field of potential cooperation between us and the Soviet Union. And that is uh, our participation in many of the international organizations and conferences which are occurring all the time. I was glad, for example, to see that the Soviet Union and the United States could agree with respect to the United Nations forces in Cyprus and more recently agreed to the United Nations forces in the Middle East. I was, I'm glad to see that on very substantial um, matters are we in the Soviet Union that takes the same general point of view in the Law of the Sea conference that was held recently in Venezuela. And I hope that little by little we can, we can uh, find ourselves working together in more of the international, the multilateral international efforts than some of us will remember back in the late 40s and, and early 50s. There is one final suggestion which I would offer which has to do with the atmospherics of our public business. I recall that during the late 1960s this committee began to eliminate a good many of the rhetorical preambles to such legislation as the various foreign aid bills and sought to legislate what we were prepared to do without excessive rhetoric. I myself thought that was a very important step in the right direction. Just as the intergovernmental communications between Washington and Moscow have become less polemic and ideological during the past dozen years, it seems to me that we can develop further a more businesslike and realistic language into our official acts. It might even be desirable to repeal such things as the Captive Nations Resolution, which would break the Soviet Union up into some dozen independent nations. But then I shall never be running for elective office and may be somewhat out of touch with the needs of those who plan to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I don't know why you should make such a dis final decision here so early <laughs> in your life. There may be many opportunities. Well, uh, Mr. Secretary, I think that's a very concise and extremely helpful dis uh, statement. And you raised some very interesting questions. Your comment about the Jackson Amendment is very timely because that matter is now under consideration and the best information I have is under active negotiation find a way in which it can be made palatable and acceptable by all concerned. I, I wanted to ask you one or two things before I yield to my colleagues. On page 11, I am very int interested in your statement there about we must approach this you see, I have just about reached the conclusion that if real progress is to be made, the approach must be wholesale rather than retail and must involve dramatic simplicity. Uh, that strikes to a very responsive chord in my mind. It reminds me of the debate we had over the first interim agreement and the growing out of the amendment offered by Senator Washington, Mr. Jackson, complaining that it wasn't adequate, if you recall that debate. Yes, indeed, I do. And I wondered if this concept you have here isn't uh, related to that, because I've very vigorously opposed that uh, idea of the equality, as they say, in all categories about what it was, and I thought it undermined the, the uh, position of the United States. I thought it, it brought into question our real sincerity in seeking any interim agreement. And now, this last meeting, we made very little progress. I mean, the progress on the threshold seems to me was purely cosmetic. There was no real progress there. The, the limitation 
ABM to one instead of two was certainly meaningless because neither side wanted to proceed with the second in any case. But I, I'd like for you to expand a bit your feeling about that as to how we might uh, proceed. I think this is a critical, most important aspect of detente is what we do about nuclear weapons. Mr. Chairman, I, um, as I indicated in my statement, um, this comes in part from a considerable review which I've undertaken over the years on the various efforts to limit arms. I mentioned the, the 332 agreement in 1922. If you look at the disarmament conferences of the early 30s, they got all tangled up in quarreling about 30 millimeters over against 50 millimeters and 81 millimeter mortars over against that kind of weapon and 75 millimeter guns over against something else. When you get enmeshed in that kind of detail, you're finished. There's just no way to work your way through that sort of mass of detail and come to a major political decision to do something real. Now, I realize that uh, this next remark of mine will be greeted with uh, uh, something less than enthusiasm on the grounds of naivety. But, but I'll just give you an example of uh, the sort of thing I think we ought to be groping for. The connection with uh, nuclear missiles. Uh, maybe we ought to think about uh, eliminating all nuclear missiles with a range of less than 1,800 miles and limiting all missiles with a range of more than 1,800 miles to 500 on each side. Something so utterly simple that everybody can understand it, that it would make a significant breakthrough into the arms limitation business and uh, try to get away from all of the admittedly highly complicated uh, attempts to balance this against that and to, um, to um, uh, get involved in forward-based systems against the ICBMs and the MRBMs in the western part of the Soviet Union and, and all those things which um, and help to break through the issue of verification. We have a very serious problem in, in, in getting agreement on the MIRVs because uh, satellite photography does not show you how many warheads are beneath a nose cone. You almost have to have a man on the spot with a screwdriver to look into the nose cone, count the warheads. So um, I personally feel that we ought, to keep, we ought to keep pressing for some very simple concept, if not the one I just mentioned, which may be impossible, something comparable to it in simplicity and, and the weight that could be attached to its result. Uh, why not zero ABMs? Suppose we have a hundred uh, ABMs out on that, those sites out in the West. Let's assume for the moment, which is quite an assumption to make, that each one of those hundred ABMs will succeed in knocking down an incoming missile. Well, that still would leave the Soviet Union over 2,000 of these wretched things and leave us with uh, something like 1,500, and only a fraction of those will do all that anybody could uh, dread. So, so why bother about uh, deploying uh, weapons that, have, that, ha that, that make no difference. So it, it's this kind of an approach that I think we ought to pursue. And, I, and I, to the extent that I'm able to or permitted to, I, I, I myself will continue to grope in that direction. I don't have the answers yet. But I think it's that kind of an answer we ought to be looking for. Well, it, uh, something needs to be done, because you described how you bogged down into detail. That's exactly where we've been. This argument about the megatonnage versus the numbers and whether they're land-based or sea-based. I mean, it, it became a completely uh, futile argument, it seemed to me, and they, they, they went exactly in the opposite direction of what you've just suggested. Would the Senator permit an Oh, certainly. I, I'd be glad to. Either one. Very nice to have you here, sir. Senator Case uh, of New Jersey. Along, right, I think it's right on this point. Uh, I think you're very much in the right, on the right track in this matter of simplicity. I wonder about carrying it a step further, and that, of, and that is of not trying to make agreements for disarmament, but rather establishing our own necessities as we see them, and then announcing uh, that we're not going to go beyond that which it seems to me would result in a very substantial reduction in our own armaments and permit similar action on the other side. When you say that 332 was great because it was so simple, 
I'm not, no, I don't have in mind exactly what the 332 was. How did, what was a unit? Well, that they... In they, the, they must have had to define yes, things in order to Yes, it was worked out make. in terms of, I believe, uh, to start Capital with ships? gross tonnage in terms of warships, but then certain classifications within it. But they, it meant that we in Britain would maintain naval forces at a level of three. Jap with Japanese two. with two. And uh, I think on the whole, that, that worked pretty well until the events in Europe, Hitler and all the rest of it. Didn't it result, in fact, though, in the Japanese building up a, uh, a good deal more than... Uh, well, there was a qualitative race that ensued. That yeah. ensued. Some of the smaller vessels got to be pretty powerful, yeah. uh, many battleships, that kind of thing. I didn't mean to suggest that I disagree at all with right, the idea. I but I wonder whether it isn't the very process of trying to make agreements that bog you down rather than uh, uh, anything else and, and stimulate building up to uh, uh, what is permitted, and even before agreements are made, uh, building up so that you can reduce by agreement to, to the point where you really want to be and all that sort of thing. I, I, I don't mean to, in any way, to, I just, I'm trying to evoke your thinking about it because I think it's enormously valuable to have your experience here. Now. Well, Senator Case, um, uh, there's one uh, very small and unhappily temporary uh, example of the effort in the direction you suggested. Back in the uh, first part of the 60s, um, we in the Soviet Union, uh, in effect, said to each other, um, now, we're not going to limit our respective freedom of action, but we will inform each other as to our proposed military expenditures. And if we can come up with some reductions, each side would try to take those into account. I think we did that for about two years, and then the unhappy events in Vietnam uh, sort of broke into that. Uh, the, the, the difficulty about um, not having an agreement, or at least some, something in the nature of an understanding, might be that if, if one side gets uh, disproportionately strong in relation to the other, the numbers of weapons may not make a difference, particularly in this nuclear field, where only a fraction of the weapons could inflict massive destruction. But it might have to do with the perceptions which are in each other's uh, minds about what the other fellow might do in a certain circumstance. And so I think at least some kind of, you, you could have an understanding which it is understood on both sides would not limit your freedom of action and try to get some parallel uh, developments, you see, in that direction. Uh, we did try, uh, without success, for over a period of some years to get the Soviet Union to sit down with us at a technical level and talk about the contents of a defense budget so that we could get some sort of basis of comparability. Uh, if they are paying their private soldiers, say, one-tenth of what we pay ours, then there's a considerable element in our defense budget that does not translate into military muscle. Uh, and there are other factors there that in, in the field of research and development where comparability would be of some, some importance. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold up uh, just on that account. I think that if we had some sort of communication between the minds of both sides that we are moving in this direction, we hope you will, we will take account of what you are doing. If we can start down this path, perhaps we can develop some momentum over time. When you speak of this, uh, you, I take it unilateral, the suggestion is certainly... Senator Fulbright. Kind of unilateral refraining from uh, taking certain actions. I'm reminded of the debate last year on the Trident. And uh, some of us who opposed that was one of the principal reasons was that if we proceed with this, this type of new weapon system, it would be the greatest, strongest incentive for the Russians to do so. It's very expensive, enormously expensive that if we did not do it, the chances are the Russians would not do it. And it, this same argument is now occurring with regard to the proposal to establish a new base at Diego Garcia. If we do it, the, those who oppose it believe that the Russians will do it. If we do not do it, the probabilities are the Russians will not do it. Uh, what disturbs me much about our policy, we appear to be always, quite often, taking the initiative. Not in the case of the ABM. The ABM, I think, is a good agreement. I've always believed that the Russians agreed to it because they'd, they'd gone far enough along the road to discover that it was not 
really a practicable weapon system in any case, so they were willing to abandon it. What do you think about this, the initiation of such things as the Trident? Well, it was the same was about Merv. If you remember, the Senate voted in a, affirmatively to that it should not proceed with deployment with the idea that if we didn't proceed with deployment, neither would the Russians, but, but the administration of the time felt that it should proceed and did proceed. And now the Russians are coming on. Do you have any comment on that? We were very hopeful in 1968 that we could um, get the SALT talk started in the fall of that year in order to be able to get hold of the MERV problem at such an early stage that it would be manageable. That was before we finished our testing, wasn't it? That's right, and the, and the, and the, uh, but now because of the delays involved, that's, that horse is pretty much out of the stable. And that's an extraordinarily unfortunate thing. I think, Mr. Chairman, that I would um, be inclined to say that if we forego qualitative improvements such as the Trident missile, we probably ought to try to talk that over seriously with the Soviet Union and get some indication from them that they will um, um, draw consequences from that and move in the same direction. I wouldn't just sort of let it st stand dangling there uh, because, um, you see, they might, uh, they might uh, just get the impression that under those circumstances that they could then achieve a very substantial so-called superiority, whatever that word means, uh, because we would not be willing to engage in any com any comparable action. I think this, uh, this idea, if pursued, ought to be pursued with the Soviet Union and not just with ourselves. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't myself um, uh, press that these matters uh, always have to be formalized in a formal agreement. Now, that may cause some problems in the Congress about um, agreements which are not formally submitted. But I should think there could be sufficient consultation between uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and the Congress so that, that problem could be dealt with. Well, whatever it's worth, uh, representatives of the Soviet Union, not the, not the chairman of the party, but uh, lesser <coughs> individuals have exa indicated exactly that, that they've they uh, feel that they're being pressured in to go down these lines when they don't want to, largely because of the extravagance of it, the expense of it. You mentioned there the question of superiority, whatever that may mean, which raises a very interesting question. Uh, I think it's almost meaningless. So would you expo explore that? Why did you say superiority, whatever it may well, mean? I think because uh, some of the people in the Senate use this word as if it's very meaningful. Well, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, that... Um um, at the present level of arms, the overkill is such that just counting weapons uh, is, is, has very little point. Uh, the numbers of weapons might have to do with what judgments are made in other capitals, perhaps even in our own, about what the consequences would be in a given course of action. And from that point of view, too disproportionate an imbalance in the numbers of weapons might have that negative uh, impact. But um, the, the briefings I used to get on, on the results of a full nuclear exchange indicated that only a small fraction of the weapons in existence could produce literally unbearable results. And so I'm not all that much impressed with numbers. Therefore, I think that if you have that much overkill, we really ought to do our best to find some way to cut down in a very far-reaching way the actual numbers of these wretched weapons. In the first instance, because um, uh, very large sums of money may be involved. In the second instance, because um, uh, the further multiplication of these weapons itself, and I used not to think of this in terms of disarmament, um, the very numbers of weapons could, in, could produce a, a situation of instability and fear and suspicion and maybe cause the fingers on the triggers to be a little more itchy just because of the sheer numbers of weapons. We, we have enormous numbers. I, I think I remember you referred to your old briefings. I think I remember hearing Secretary McNamara at one point say 400 ICBMs was adequate to cause, as you say, unbearable, unacceptable damage on the Soviet Union. 
We know we're now up into the thousands, as you know. The latest briefing we had about numbers was uh, incalculably greater than that, as you know, and we have them spread all around the world. So it, it, I think your comment about superiority, whatever that may mean, is is a very well taken. I think the secretary was quoted recently in one of his news conferences saying, what, what do you do with superiority? What does it mean? And what value is, is it? Indicating the same thought, I think, that you had, that we've gotten so far along the overkill route that it makes meaningless these debates about specific numbers or specific limitations, which makes all the more appropriate your idea about the wholesale uh, treatment of this, that it, 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 just fiddling around with the numbers and uh, it will get us nowhere except bogged down into, into uh, futility. Uh, one of our former witnesses, oh, Senator Sparkman, I don't want you, would you, you have go ahead. Ahead. You're doing go ahead. Very fine job. I'll, I'll come in it later. Uh, one of our former witnesses did make the suggestion that in view of this enormous surplus of weapons, that a unilateral reduction would not expose us to any, any uh, danger of any kind, but would test out at least the, this idea about uh, whether or not the Soviets would respond in an informal or tacit manner. We have such difficulty with the formal agreements and getting into these details as illustrated by the interim agreement and the enormous debate about it. It seems to me it might be in pursuit of what's your idea of a wholesale approach to where if you could do it without any serious exposure to danger and I would think if our theory about overkill is correct and yours that it could be done in that way. You have it? Do you think there's any merit in that idea? <clears throat> I would um, hope that if we uh, started on that trail uh, unilaterally that we wouldn't um, find ourselves some years hence looking around and saying, where is everybody? Is anybody else coming down this road with us? Now, I would hope that we would um, be able to stimulate some uh, comparable reductions on the part of other nuclear powers. Um, this is the sort of thing that I, that I have in mind on that point, Mr. Chairman. Um, we had the impression after the Cuban Missile Crisis that um, some of the Soviet leaders um, thought that we had been counting missiles at the time of that crisis. And that because we considered that we had a very large missile superiority, therefore we would do what we did in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And one of them commented, you'll never, you got away with it this time, but you'll never get, get away with it again. And if you look at the lead time factor, one of the consequences of the Cuban Missile Crisis might have been a very substantial Soviet buildup in their missile forces. Um, now, again, this goes to, uh, as a matter of fact, we, we weren't counting missiles at that time. We felt that was a situation which had to be dealt with, and I didn't see any missile counts on both sides during that period. Uh, but nevertheless, they perceived that to be the case. So that uh, if perceptions might turn on counting weapons then some mistakes can be made, some misjudgments can be made. So I'd want to be just a little careful to try to involve them somehow in this process and, and well, try to get them to say, yes, if you start down that road, we'll go with you. Well, of course you'd, you'd have to be involved. It wouldn't take very long to, to see whether or not they're responding, and, and then you have to adjust additionally. You don't make a irreversible decision not to do these things. It's up purely a temporary decision. Yes, but up until um, you mentioned Secretary McNamara, he um, and the presidents he served uh, brought our missile deployment pretty much to a standstill until the MIRV deployments entered the picture. Uh, we weren't building additional ICBMs, and um, our submarine fleet was pretty much frozen at, what was it, 43 or something of that sort. Um, during that period, there was a considerable buildup on, on, on the part of the Soviet Union. Um, 
I think this is something that is worth discussing with the Soviet Union. There's never been any doubt, though, during this period, has there, in your mind, that we had substantially greater firepower, if you want to call it that way, translated nuclear weapons. They, they've always been in the position of trying to catch up, have they not? Uh, I think during much of this period that is so, but I think they might have overdone it a little here lately. <laughs> well, that's right. But now, look, uh, what about the reverse? We've, we've been confronted all during this period with this idea of bargaining chips. The ABM was defended on the ground. And we give them a, it's a bargaining chip. It's something to build in order to trade away. And in that case, we did. They've used it on all the others. Why not the reverse theory of very publicly and plainly saying, we will not take such and such a stake as an inducement for you not to do it and see how that works. This other hasn't worked clearly. It's been followed now for a number of years. It's resulted in each in an escalation. Yes, I think one further example of this uh, was the um, effort made by, uh, I think first by President Eisenhower, then by President Kennedy, saying that uh, we would not conduct atmospheric uh, nuclear tests uh, so long as uh, others would follow suit. Now, that's an illustration of a technique. Uh, it broke down uh, when uh, major testing was resumed by the Soviet Union. Uh, but um, I think these things ought to be explored very carefully. But the breaking down didn't expose us to any. We knew it, and uh, we, we responded uh, immediately. That's or, correct. So That's correct. Wasn't, we didn't really run any risk. That's right. But in some of these missile programs, the lead time is so, is so important that um, one would have to have to keep that in mind, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not opposing the, uh, the, the suggestion. As I indicated earlier, we, we tried this on for a brief period in terms of our total defense expenditures, and we exchanged information about uh, comparable reductions in our defense budgets there for two or three years. All right, I have some other questions, but I will yield for the moment. <coughs> well, Mr. Chairman, there's a roll call on that we're going to... What's the, what is it about? About a passage of this bill, I think. Can you find out what it is? Could we resist for five minutes? Um, sure. I, I'll be very brief. First, I want to say, uh, Mr. Secretary, I think you've given us one of the finest reviews of the period that you covered that I have ever seen. I think it's a very fine discussion. Senator Jones, Parkman, uh, Alabama. Let me ask you this question. When we talk about superiority and we talk about numbers of these various weapons and so forth, I believe uh, one of our witnesses has pointed out that uh, we could, uh, that we had sufficient uh, uh, weapons uh, that we could destroy Russia 15 times, wasn't it? <laughs> well, why do we need uh, 14 if, we, if the object is to be in position to destroy the Soviet Union, why do we have to have do it 15 times. And I presume the same thing uh, applies to uh, Russia. Well, that was one of the reasons why in the early 60s, um, with the help of this committee, we established the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency in order to get competent people like Mr. William Foster and Mr. Adrian Fisher to concentrate their complete attention to the possibilities of uh, doing something about this matter. I don't want to uh, sound uh, overly dramatic or um, uh, don't, don't want to scare anybody, but I remember the first session when President Kennedy and his senior colleagues were, were given a full briefing on the total effects of a nuclear exchange. And it was a pretty, pretty harrowing experience. And I remember as we left the cabinet room, President Kennedy turned to me and said, um, and we call ourselves the human race. Now, you're, you're quite right. Uh, for, the other 14 times ought to be worked on. As a matter of fact, I still believe myself that, the, that one nuclear power is too many. I think it was extraordinarily unfortunate that somehow the Baruch plan, plan did not become effective. And if we could find some way to deal with the problem of verification, I today would strongly support going right back to zero nuclear weapons. Because in terms of the safety of the American people, it is obvious to me that we are much less safe today than we were before these wretched weapons ever came into existence. Well, what is your thought about uh, the 
spread. Um, of course, I think we were all taken by surprise not too long ago when India exploded a nuclear device. And uh, we have uh, we have tried to uh, stop the spread of it by treaty, but uh, it, it's certainly not uh, not yet effective. And I believe someone testified in in these hearings that we had that there were. Oh, I don't know how many, but uh, quite a number of different nations. Used to, we said, been in the beginning, we had it all. And then Russia came in, and we shared with Britain, and France came in. And uh, someone pointed out to us that uh, there was a large number of nations capable of developing nuclear weapons. So we're not doing very well on the non-proliferation, are we? No, and I'm very much concerned about this because the, the larger the number of countries that obtain these weapons, uh, the greater the dangers that somehow they will be used in an irresponsible fashion sometime. And I try to say that without patronizing the non-nuclear countries. It's just, uh, it's just one, of the, one of the facts of life. Um, almost every high school physics textbook tells you how to make one of these things. I mean, there's no secret anymore. The biggest secret of all was given away by the United States when we dropped one of these weapons over Hiroshima and demonstrated it could be, could be done. That was 95% of the secret right there. So um, I do think this is important. And perhaps one of the ways to encourage nonproliferation would be to get some pretty far-reaching, dramatic, and simple reduction in the number of nuclear weapons on the part of those who, who have them. I think there's one thing that some other countries may not understand, and, and that is that they are inclined to think that the possession of nuclear weapons somehow is liberating, that it puts them into a, a status of greater freedom of action. This is not so. Nuclear weapons imprison you. It has a they certain limit your freedom of, of action. A certain degree of prestige. Yes, but they, uh, they, they, they tie chains around those who, who, who possess them. And um, I don't think anybody who has nuclear weapons is going to find themselves happy about it if they sit back and think about it a little bit. Let me ask you, how long were you Secretary of State? Uh, eight years from January 61 to January 69. I uh, knew you had a long term. I believe I said to you one time that I hoped you would uh, stay on and achieve uh, complete seniority in that regard. You didn't quite do that. Eight years are too long, Senator. Well, I'll say this, you were a great Secretary of State. Thanks. You uh, performed well. Aren't you holding a chair at the University of Georgia now? Yes, the Samuel H. Sibley Chair of uh, International Law at the University of Georgia Law School. Well, I'm, I'm certainly glad that you came up here to appear, and uh, I want to commend you for the wonderful statement that you've given us and the answers to the questions. I wonder if I could ask you to think a bit about the question about the effect of others. Some of our allies, or some who are not allies, who are, appear to be against detente between the Russians and ourselves. The theme seems to be that uh, if we relax at all, that we will then release the Russians to cause them trouble. In other words, we're sort of looked upon as the as the agency to to preoccupy the Russians to keep them devoting their energies and so on and, uh, and their money and their policy against us, giving them freedom of action. I think I detect that in certain areas. I notice there's more uh, there's less sympathy for detente in other countries than there is at least in this committee. I uh, think I detect that in the attitude of some of the people in Europe. They're against our re re reduction of troops and against the reduction of anything. And I have the feeling that it's largely because they feel we're their protector and they feel more comfortable and certainly much less expensive for us to do it than it is for them to do it. At least they've vigorously opposed any uh, reduction in these conventional forces, which 
uh, makes me feel that they don't recognize the significance of nuclear weapons. When, I, when they signed the ABM Treaty, I thought that marked a rather significant watershed that here's both countries officially saying that we have no defense against the other's nuclear weapons and that they would not undertake to build a defense against them because it was futile. Now, I, I honestly find it difficult to see why in the particular case in Europe we should continue to keep that many troops. I wouldn't object, as you know, we voted several times in the Senate to a reduction from 300,000 roughly plus dependents of nearly 500,000, which cost us a very large amount of money, to a more modest sum. Those troops were, were substantially increased after that Munich conference that you mentioned, were they not? That's correct. And uh, we got along before that time. Now, with the ABM Treaty, with at least SALT-1 under our belts, why is it necessary uh, to keep that many troops? Why wouldn't it contribute something to detente if we reduced it? It wouldn't be a major contribution, but would be a significant one, it seems to me. <clears throat> I think there has been some... Uh inattention to the nuclear situation in some places in Western Europe. And there have been times when they and on some occasions we ourselves have um, been very unrealistic in such things as the plate glass doctrine, the trip wire doctrine, as though any fighting on the borderline between the NATO countries and the Warsaw Pact countries would move immediately into nuclear war. That just has no contact with the real world as far as I'm concerned. And I think it has taken quite a long time for some of our friends in Europe to try to think through a little bit more of this whole nuclear business. As far as detente is concerned, I was at a conference this summer on the other side of the Atlantic discussing detente. One of my European friends said, uh, what are you Amer Americans doing behind our back? I said, we're following you. And when you follow somebody, you're usually behind their back. The Europeans developed major trade with Eastern Europe. The Europeans have cutting, been cutting back on their uh, military establishments. Um, even Luxembourg took a battalion, the only battalion it had, out of the NATO forces. Um, Ostpolitik uh, generated some momentum for European reasons, um, quite apart from whatever we were doing with the Soviet Union. On the troop removal business, um, I do hope that uh, we can reduce our forces somewhat um, uh, without uh, upsetting the balance between the NATO and the Warsaw Pact forces. I'm rather pessimistic about any real outcome of the talks on mutual and balanced force reductions. Um, but um, if, we, if we draw down those conventional forces substantially, I would think that would mean that we would uh, have to bring our tactical nuclear weapons back. Well, again, uh, the question would be to see what the reaction is. If we took one, and then we see what if there was any mutual tacit re reaction to it, uh, favorable. Uh, these are very hard agreements to make. It's an illustration of the principle we were talking about a moment ago. I wonder what would be the effect if you reduced them from 300 to 200 and uh, observe what happens in the interim, if anything. It's, uh, it's not any big thing anymore to, to shift them about. I think Senator Jackson or others who've uh, commented upon the Chinese attitude that the Chinese welcome our, our favor, our maintaining our forces there and, and uh, also wherever they are, whether they're on the seas or there. Again, it seems to me their motive would be that simply helps protect them, or at least uh, diverts. Uh... I wouldn't um, myself attach too much importance to that, because um, um, first place, I don't think that Moscow, Peking, and Washington ought to try to play cute games of balancing one or off against the other and that kind of thing. That, um, and in any event, the um, military power of the Soviet Union is so very substantial, I would think the Chinese 
primarily preoccupied with that and not whether um, the West might somehow afford some leverage or counterbalance. Uh, of course, that argument is used primarily to justify increased uh, appropriations for the military. You notice in the morning paper that in the result of the conference that the amounts which the Senate had allowed, at least, were increased, as which is always happens in conference. And this is just one of the peripheral arguments made that to keep up uh, the very large defense forces which we have. I would uh, hope that we could find some way uh, to avoid pricing ourselves out of the defense market. Um, I understand that between 55 and 60 percent of our defense budget now goes for pay, and that does not automatically translate into military muscle. So I think we've got to think of every way that we can to um, cut down on our defense costs. I mean, for example, I, as an infantryman, I would be glad to see the infantry foot soldier be provided with a completely decisive anti-tank weapon and drive tanks back to the stage of the horse cavalry. And that would save very large amounts of money and would make a difference in, in the NATO-Warsaw Pact relationship. And there may be other ways. I'm, I'm not all that enthusiastic about these diamond-studded jobs that Admiral Rickover turns out. And um, maybe we could find a more, uh, more inexpensive way to, to accomplish that particular part of our defense mission. But um, the most important way, it seems to me, to cut back on our defense forces would be to get uh, some wholesale limitations. Yeah. Between I agree with that. that. That would be, that's the best way, but uh, we're always seeking something we, that is doable. Whether we can do that or not, I would, right. I would certainly favor that. But uh, in the absence of being able to do that, the smaller, smaller uh, moves, refraining from it, for example, I, I feel that very strongly about Diego Garcia, that if we do it, uh, it's certainly an invitation, if not a very persuasive on the Russians to do likewise somewhere so that we don't come out any better off than we are now. We just raise the, the ante up to a higher level and in view of our domestic economic situation, which really concerns all of us now, but uh, I find that when we talk about defense, we always seem to be talking about it in a compartment unrelated to the domestic security, domestic economy. And uh, if we have a real...